You are listening to One Nation Under Crime, a chronological true crime podcast. Each week, we go through our nation's history and discuss one case from each year, starting in 1800. I'm Kayla. And I'm Leah. And this week, we are taking a deep dive into Alexander Hamilton, Aaron Burr, and ending in a duel in Weehawken. Because everything is legal in New Jersey. Which we'll get to that, trust me. <laughs> um, so, yeah. It's, there might be a lot of quotes from the musical yeah. during this. I'm just going to we'll throw try. it out there. We'll try. Um, so, yeah, our sources for this, uh, widely, I mean, Wikipedia, then Biography.com, uh, Britannica Encyclopedia, and then, of course, the book by Ron Chernow, Alexander Hamilton. So, we're in 1804, so this is kind of... Few of the things that were going on then. Uh, February 15th, New Jersey becomes the last northern state to abolish slavery. February 16th, in the first Barbary War, Stephen Decatur leads a raid to burn the pirate held ship USS Philadelphia, which we discussed Philadelphia in episode three. Uh, February 18th, Ohio University is declared by the Ohio General Assembly. March 26th, Orleans Territory is created, which turns into New Orleans later on. May 14th, the Lewis and Clark Expedition departs from Camp Dubois and begins their historic journey by traveling up the Missouri River. And then December 3rd, Thomas Jefferson defeats Charles C. Pickney in the U.S. presidential election. Mm -hmm. So, I'm going to go ahead and say it here. There will be quotes in this episode that do have some adult language. Yeah. I'm going to go ahead and say it now. And there's not going to be a trigger warning level on this episode. But there is plenty of scandal. Yes. To go around. If you've seen the musical, you already know some of it. (laughs) So, uh, like I said, there is some language and some quotes. Um, Can't really get around them too much is what it is. It's what was said. Um, so, yeah, you got kiddos that you don't want them to hear certain words. Just FYI. Um, and not inherently just terrible words. It's just, it's one word that is repeated that apparently a lot of people loved back then. Oh, dear. So, <laughs> uh, so yeah, uh, this one could be a doozy because we got a lot of ground to cover. Yep. Um. To truly do this justice, we absolutely have no choice. And this is our first two-part episode. <laughs> so excited. Surprise! Surprise! It's our first two-parter. Only only five episodes in, we got to a two-parter. But there really is. There's so much information on both, um, both men in these cases. And, you know... There's a lot to go around. Yep. Um, I will try to keep the Hamilton references to a minimum, but I'm not making any promises. Because sometimes you just got to move when the spirit leads you. <laughs> and I might have put some Easter eggs throughout oh. the notes. So That's exciting. Yes. Um, and there is one part where I am going to directly quote for a bit straight from the show because um, it was the best way to describe something that was going on. And why reinvent the wheel. And so, yeah, I'll, I'll get to that part. So if you, it, it's, it's great. Anyways, um, I am very aware that the man... Alexander Hamilton is problematic in a couple of ways, Mm -hmm. and I'm not going to shy away from discussing them. I can separate Lin-Manuel Miranda as Hamilton from Alexander Hamilton. Yes. Um, But there's no denying that he absolutely was a genius. He was a genius. We will go over it, like I said, in a few different ways. He is very, very talented. There's a lot of things um, that that we have to thank him for. He's a polymath. Yeah, and a, okay. Um, <clears throat> I was about to finish that, and I realized language doesn't need to come in that soon. Um, so yeah, 
Uh, this week, we will specifically discuss the life, military, career, accomplishments, and downfalls of Alexander Hamilton. Yep. Next week, we will move on to Aaron Burr and the infamous duel in Weehawken. Mm-hmm. There is also a little bonus section at the end of the next episode that I could not leave out. Oh. So we will discuss it as well. I can't wait to see. You will. You'll, you'll like it. I know you will. Um... <laughs> So, these men have a lot of history between them, and it's accumulation of events that led to the duel, like the end. Um, and so, that's why it is important to go through both of their lives, because there there are places where they do cross paths. You can kind of see um, along the lines of Hamilton's life, um, while they did have similar-ish childhoods, um, not completely the same. Right. And they had some common threads, but not exactly. Yes. And so, and I'll go ahead and tell you, um, you know, if you are a fan of the musical Hamilton, like we are, keep in mind that the musical is written from Hamilton's perspective. Right. And it's for entertainment. And therefore, Burr is the villain. Sure. Um, we will go through in the next episode, Burr, and he does have his share of extremely impressive accomplishments yes. that are not gone over, but he was also kind of trash. Yeah. So we'll discuss that as well, because, uh, I mean, you know. They both had their shortcomings. They both do have their shortcomings. Uh, arguably, Burr would have more. Um. More involved shortcomings, there you I'll go. say. Just very, just just wide, widespread. But yeah, so we'll go through both of them. And if you are a fan of the musical and you have watched it, you've listened to it, you know, you're a huge fan of it, you'll also see how some artistic liberties were taken. Yes, yes, yes. Um, which were disappointing. Um <laughs> Because well, I want it to be just like the musical. Well, you do, but, but I mean, you know, when you're trying to fit it into a show, which was masterfully done, oh, by the way, so well. you know, some things have to be pared down and have to, you know, be right, changed a do. little. Just like mm-hmm. with, I know they're totally not the same thing, but the Goldbergs, I love that show. And it is very loosely based on Adam Goldberg's life. But there are actually three sons. And in the show, there's an older sister and two brothers. And they did that just to, you know, reach more audiences and have a a daughter in there. So there are, you know, artistic liberties taken, but it is kept as true as possible, you know. But Mm -hmm. there's no way to just keep it exactly Mm -hmm. true and it still be entertaining. Right. And um, which we know one of the biggest. uh, Because I don't. Again, I'm really going to try and hold it back with Hamilton references and, and information. But in Hamilton, he actually, uh, Lynn Manuel Miranda actually went back and forth with Ron Chernow, who wrote the biography of Alexander Hamilton to make sure that things were kind of as accurate as they could right. be. Um, and, and the main points lined up. Right. And one of the things that actually is extremely false uh comes in satisfied yeah Yeah, the song satisfied um angelica specifically says my father has no sons and that's definitely did and she was already married when hamilton came on the scene as well and in the play she's not we'll get into that and we'll also talk about more of their relationship right um so, yeah, we will, and, and she is a little bit more involved. And I'm not sure if she was married. I'll have to, when we get to that part, I'll have to see, because I do talk about her and when she does get married. So we'll have to see exactly when, what that timeline is. From what I recall from reading and such that I've done, she was already married. But I could be wrong. Yeah, I'm not sure. I don't remember. I, I know there's a section of it in this episode, so we'll, we'll, we'll get to it. Okay. I'll be proven correct. <laughs> <laughs> in uh 2016, a survey done by Washington College found that 71% of Americans were, quote, fairly certain Alexander Hamilton was a past president. I I think that that is way too high of a number. 
but it's not super difficult to see how people could mistake him for one. Alexander Hamilton was one of the founding fathers of the United States. So I think that's where a lot of the confusion comes in. And he is on money. Yes. And There's a reason, and we'll get to it. Oh, yes. We will, but, we'll I mean, that's why, why people yeah. think that. So Britannica states the founding fathers were, quote, the most prominent statesmen of the American revolutionary generation, responsible for the successful war for colonial independence from Great Britain, the liberal ideas celebrated in the Declaration of Independence, and the Republican form of governmental defined in the United States Constitution. So given all of that, there is not a set list of requirements to be a founding father. Um, and if there were a checklist right. that you had to go off of. Let me guess. You've, you've made one up. No. I mean, <laughs> there, there, are, there are people who have uh, made up, you know, they have their own, they've come up with lists of, of what they are. But they would be that they have to have a major contribution to the American Revolution mm-hmm. or when independence was won. So right. it had to be either during the war or right as it was like won. Like setting up the nation. Mm-hmm. Um, or a part of the Constitutional Convention. <laughs> so the ones that are more widely known are ones that took place. They had a part in all of it. Right. Together. So the list changes based on which historians you ask. Um, you know, like I said, there's no set real standard on how to decide who's who. Um, but, uh, there are 10 that most all historians will agree with. And based on my knowledge of the revolution, which is vast because it is my favorite time period. Um, these would also be the same ones that I would, that I would call. Founding Fathers. Okay. First up, we have George Washington. Shocker. The original OG. (laughs) (laughs) He founded, I mean, you could say he founded the Founding Fathers. Yeah. Um, So then after him, and I think this might be in alphabetical order, um, so not based on importance, but there was John Adams, Samuel Adams. Yes. Samuel Adams. Sam Adams. (laughs) Um, the beer, if you're, um, if you're from the U S and you do know about, about widely known beers, then yes, uh, that Samuel Adams, Benjamin Franklin, Alexander Hamilton, Patrick Henry, James Madison, John Marshall, and George Mason. But whether you call him a founding father, politician, military commander, American statesman, legal scholar, banker, economist, lawyer, or a bastard orphan, son of a whore, and a Scotsman, Alexander Hamilton left a legacy for better or for worse. Yes. This is the word that will come up a lot. I thought maybe that was it. So I figured I might as well just go ahead and put it at the beginning. That's the that's the word that's going to pop up. Well, I mean that was used a lot. I mean, it's it's it it was differently now. Yes, it now it is considered you know a quote swear word, right? But in that time, it it was a a actual term to describe someone who was an an illegitimate child. Yes, Um, someone born out of wedlock. Out of wedlock. Yes. So January 11th, 1755 or 1757, Alexander Hamilton was born in the British West Indies on the island of Nevis to a Rachel Fawcett and James A. Hamilton. July 12th, 1804, Alexander Hamilton dies due to injuries sustained 31 hours earlier from being shot in a duel against Aaron Burr in Weehawken, New Jersey. So as you might have noticed, when I discussed his birth year, there's two different dates. Mm -hmm. So it's either 1755 or 1757. There's a reason. So in Hamilton's writings himself, he states 1757. 
Later, historians found documentation that stated at the time of his mother's death, he was 13, which would make his date of birth 1755. Interesting. But because at this time, Hamilton was now an orphan and he was on his own, he might have lied about his age to be able to get a job. Yeah. So he might have actually been 11 at the time, said he was 13. Right. So he could get a job. Um, and we'll, we'll discuss. Because he was smart. Right. And we'll discuss that more as well. Um, at the time of Hamilton's birth, Rachel, his mother, was married to a man named John. I believe the last name is pronounced La- uh, Lavian. Lavian? Lavian? He was very... <clears throat> problematic. Oh. Rachel was forced to marry John when she was a teenager, and they had a son together named Peter. When Rachel's father died in 1745, she inherited a very large sum of money, and John took it upon himself to spend almost all of it. Oh, how kind. Mm-hmm. John was very abusive and even had Rachel imprisoned for several months when he accused her of adultery. Oh, maybe it wasn't unfounded? Uh, at this time it was. Okay. I'm just saying. Yes. Um, it, it was very, the couple, so the couple lived in St. Croix in the Virgin Islands. And at the time the islands were owned by Denmark and then they were under Denmark laws. Okay. So under these laws, if you accused your wife, not your husband, Mm. if you accused your wife of adultery, she could be placed in prison for an unknown amount of time. Awesome. Mm -hmm. So it said that possibly he said that to kind of as another alternate form of punishment for her. And to get her out of the way so he could Mm -hmm. spend some money. Mm -hmm. Well, at this time, most of it was gone. Oh. He had spent so much of it that most of it was gone. So he was tired of hearing about how he was spending the money. Mm -hmm. When Rachel was released from prison, instead of going home to John and her son Peter, she ran. Well, I mean. Yeah. And she ended up in St. Kitts where she met James A. Hamilton. They moved in together and eventually moved to Nevis, which was Rachel's birthplace. Okay. Um, Rachel had inherited a plot of land after her father's death that was in Nevis, but she was living in St. Croix at the time, so she couldn't get the land because she wasn't living there at the time. Oh. So that was why she went back. Uh, The couple had a son named John Jr. in 1753, and in 1757, Maybe. But Alexander was born. But the new family did not last long after Alexander was born. And John Sr. abandoned the family when Alexander was a child. It doesn't say how old exactly he was when he left. A lot of sources just kept calling him a boy. Yeah. So it's safe to say he probably was younger. He did have an older brother. Um, so child, is that's what we're going to go with. Uh, John Sr.'s reason for leaving his family was to spare Rachel a charge of bigamy because she was still married to John, other John, John Lavian. Because she was still married to John Lavian, he intended on divorcing Rachel under Danish law, which just apparently at the time was fantastic. (laughs) And he was going to divorce her on grounds of desertion, like, She left. She left. And adultery. Rachel would have been put in prison because of these accusations. Mm -hmm. And like we said, for an unknown amount of time. She could have even been killed because of these accusations. Right. So there was no John Sr. Hamilton. That's what I'm going to call him. You know, he left saying that he didn't want that. But there's, you know, really no evidence as to what happened. But also, on the other hand, um. Hamilton, Alexander Hamilton, does write his dad, and his dad will sign his letters like your loving father, yeah. John, you know, Hamilton. So it's not said that they necessarily had a bad relationship. They just didn't have much of a relationship. Yeah, because dad wasn't there. hmm So Rachel had no choice but to take her two sons and move back to St. Croix. Um, She ran a small shop to make ends meet, 
And February 18th, 1768, at 1.02 a.m., very specific, at the age of 38, Rachel succumbed to yellow fever and young Hamilton was an orphan. Yep. Mm -hmm. It was at a mercantile in town that Hamilton was exposed to the world of international commerce. James Jr., uh, you know, his older brother, and Hamilton moved in with a cousin, Peter Lytton. I believe, again, that might be how you pronounce it. It's, it doesn't. It You're could, doing your best. I am. It could be Lytton. It <laughs> could be Lytton. Um, but after a short period of time, Peter took his own life um, in July of 1769. Uh, so they were only there less than a year. Yeah. Um, or a little bit every year. He left his property, uh, the the cousin, left his property to his mistress and his son. Ooh. And so this is when Alexander was separated from his brother, James Jr. Uh, James Jr. went to be a carpenter's apprentice. And Alexander, still working for the mercantile in town, was given a home by Thomas Stevens, who was a local merchant. So that's where he's learning his trade. Mm -hmm. So, but so Thomas Stevens was not the owner of the mercantile because I kind of got that confused. He was not the owner of the mercantile, but he was a merchant who did frequently work with that mercantile for bringing in goods from other okay. places. So that's probably how they met. There's also some speculation that, which it's not true. If you look at, you know, things from back then, there was some speculation that Thomas Stevens might have actually been Alexander's dad. But, anyway, so, hmm. if you if you even look at the timeline, there's no way, because he was in St. Croix when they were in Nivis where he was born. So right. there's no way he could be the dad, but they said that they carried on a lot of the same mannerisms and things like that. So anyways, he um, probably modeled himself after mm -hmm. him because he didn't have a dad. So, um, then a hurricane came and the events on August 30th, 1772 changed Hamilton's life forever. All because of a letter. And this is just, there's ever a way for your life to change. This is a crazy way. Yeah. Hamilton was still in contact with his biological father and wrote to him often. One of these letters detailed the events that devastated the island. So Reverend Hugh Knox was a tutor to Hamilton and he, you know, taught him how to write and, you know, all the flowery language. Well, he read the letter and submitted the letter to be published as an essay in the Royal Danish American Gazette. So took this letter. This is an this is an essay now. Sent it to them, and once the leaders in the community read the essay, they then created a fund for Hamilton's education. In October of the same year, so this hurricane was in August. So just in October of that year, um, Hamilton stepped off of a ship in Boston and made his way to New York City. He lodged for a little bit of time with an Irishman named Hercules Mulligan. I've heard that. Mulligan had a brother who traded with the same men who paid for Hamilton to go to the colonies. Okay. So, yeah. So, Hercules' brother worked with the same merchants in St. Croix. So, that's how he that's got to That's kind of the hookup. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, Mulligan helped Hamilton sell cargo to help pay for Hamilton's education and to basically help him keep a roof over his head in the meantime. In the fall of 1773, Hamilton uh, started as a private student at King's College. Um, and, and there is a difference between apparently in that time between starting as a private student and starting as an actual student. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't go into it because there's too much. Um, even though he went to the colonies for his education, his main interest became the revolution. Robert Troop was Hamilton's roommate in college, and Troop frequently commented on Hamilton's ability to consciously explain the Patriots' position against the British. So he's basically saying, 
this guy can break it down as to why we're doing what we're yeah. doing. He, he can lay right. it out so that everybody can understand what's going on. Right. Um, unfortunately, Hamilton's education was cut short when the British occupied New York City and King's College had to close their doors. So then, Hamilton and a group of friends from King's College joined a volunteer militia called the Corsicans in 1775 after the Battle at Lexington and Concord, which, if you learned about American history, that is the shot heard around the world. That's that battle. And if you're, since we have international listeners, apparently, yeah. if, you, um, if you aren't very aware of the Battle of Lexington and Concord, it was initially where the Patriots or Americans and the British, um, they kind of had a standoff and no one was doing anything and someone shot. And they call it the shot heard around the world because it was the shot that started the American Revolution. Yeah. And, it set off the chain of mm-hmm. events. So the Americans say that it came from the British, and the British say that it came from the Americans. Either way, whoever fired that gun started the entire American Revolution. So that's why it's called the shot heard around the world. I mean, everybody was kind of primed for mm-hmm. it, but nobody was ready to take the first step. Mm-hmm. It's like, we're not going to be held liable for starting this, but if you won't start it. So what I love to think of in this at some point is that this was just like some, some like 17 year old that was like, like tripping was over fumbling. his gun. <laughs> and like, and oh, like oh no, <laughs> was that me? <laughs> Didn't mean that. So Hamilton ended up uh, becoming a captain and fought alongside George Washington. It was the Battle of Princeton where Hamilton really proved himself. So January 3rd, 1777, Washington rallied his troops to charge against the British forces. The British fell back um, with some just running to Nassau Hall, which was nearby, and others just running away from Princeton altogether. They just (laughs) took off. Um, And Hamilton showed up with three cannons and fired on the building while other patriots were storming the front door. So they kind of trapped him in there. It wasn't long before a white flag appeared outside of one of the windows and the British surrendered. The Americans won the battle, and 194 British soldiers walked out and laid down their weapons. Alexander started getting offers to be the aid to several generals, um, like left and right. Mm-hmm. Everybody wanted him. And uh, these William Alexander was one of them, Nathaniel Green, Henry Knox. Alexander McDougal and Lord Sterling were all generals that that came to Hamilton wanting wanting him to help them. He declined all of them, and he thought that fighting would pay off best for him in the long run. But the golden ticket arrived. Yes. And I want you to be proud of me that I've not spat it off a single line. I know. It's it's been hard. <laughs> I've been pinching my lips together. Nathaniel Green and Henry Knox wanted to hire you to be their secretary. secretary. I don't don't think think so. so. Yeah, yeah, it was hard. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So anyways, the golden ticket arrived and George Washington needed a right-hand man. Here comes the general. And he requested Hamilton as an aide and offered him the position of lieutenant colonel. And you can't tell George Washington no. No. I mean, no, no, you can't. You can't tell him no. Washington was quoted saying um, aide de camps, which aide de camps just mean kind of like an, an assistant in the military. Yeah. Uh, A right hand man. Yeah. I mean, I mean, really, right-hand it is. Man. Quote, aide de camps are persons in whom entire confidence must be placed, and it requires men of abilities to execute the duties with propriety and dispatch. It would be four years of writing letters to Congress, drafting Washington's orders and directing them, um, diplomacy, then negotiations, and issuing orders. And Hamilton actually signed his name to a lot of these orders. Like, that's how high up he got. Mm -hmm. Washington didn't have to sign any general orders. Because they knew who he was. Mm -hmm. It was coming straight from Hamilton, and so he was signing a lot of them. Uh, It was around this time that Hamilton was also writing to his friends. 
Marquis de Lafayette, and John Lawrence, who were also fighting in the war. And a quick side note on these letters. You will look into this, and you might see some speculation. Ooh. Um, there is an American historian of human sexuality whose name is Jonathan Ned Katz, who has reviewed these letters written between the men. And given the writing style and the references to Greek mythology and history, Katz thinks there might have been a homosexual relationship between the men, but more leaning towards the letters between Hamilton and Lawrence. But biographer Gregory D. Massey has dismissed these claims entirely and said it's nothing more than the writing style of the time. And with these men being educated, it, it's not a shock that they have more advanced writing style. Mm -hmm. Also, I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to get out my soapbox for two seconds. I'll put it back. It's going to go back up. I promise. But let's just go ahead and get out of the way that it one if they did have some kind of extracurricular sexual relationship, <laughs> so what? Like, I, okay, okay, fine. Why, why bring it up now? So what? We also don't know that, so you're just engaging in speculation. Two, just like the stigma around mental health and how much that stigma needs to go away, so does the idea that two men can't have a close relationship with one another and discuss intimate details of their lives without something sexual going on. Mm -hmm. Let's go ahead and just people joke and they'll be like, oh, they've got a bromance going and stuff like that. And like, yeah, that's fine. You can say that. But let's not just sit there and say, oh, these two men were way too close. So clearly something was yeah. going on. That's not OK. You know, like men need to have somebody to talk to too. If two right. women were talking to each other about their feelings and they were going in depth with them, you wouldn't say, "Oh, those women clearly something's going on." Right? Say they're having a conversation. They're so, they're t they're bosom buddies. Grow, you know, grow up, people. Like just just grow up. Just because uh, you know, it's just aggravating because you are out on a battlefield. No one is around you. You you're writing orders all day. And you only have these couple of friends that you can discuss your life with. And, you, and you've got a lot of emotions going on right. and you need an outlet for that. And so I just think that it's very reckless for someone to speculate they had a relationship mm -hmm. when there's no concrete proof. If they did, great. Happy for them. Good for you. You go, Glenn Coco. Just like I said in the last episode. <laughs> but... It, but, but you know, also, two things can exist, right? And it doesn't change the good and nope. the impact that they've had on our country, just on, on our history. It, right. doesn't, it doesn't change that. And two things can exist at the same time. Yeah. Men can be very, very close with another man and discuss intimate details of their lives. And they can also just be friends. Yeah. So I've, I've stepped down. I've put the soapbox away. I'm off of it now. Moving forward. Moving forward. <laughs> just had to say that. It, it it just bothers me a lot when people do that. And it's just like. Yeah, it's just speculation. What's the point? Are yeah. you trying to say that, because at that time that was very taboo. So are you trying to say, are you trying to just like besmirch their legacy? Or mm -hmm. what's, what's your end game yeah. here? And it doesn't seem that there is one to me. So. Uh, from December of 1779 to March of 1780, Hamilton was stationed in Morristown, New Jersey, where he met Elizabeth Eliza Schuyler, who was the daughter of a well-known general in the war, Philip Schuyler. December 14th, um, Alexander Hamilton and Eliza Schuyler were married. I will refer to her as Eliza. Other people called her Betsy. I don't see it. Well, it's a nickname for Elizabeth. Philippa Sue. It's Eliza. Okay. It's refuse. <laughs> refuse. Um, so anyways, December 14th of 1980, Alexander Hamilton and Eliza Schuyler were married. The couple had eight children. Again, as I said in episode two, too many? Yes. 
Two. <laughs> I, I mean, I have zero, so I've, I have one, and I'm and I love children, but <sighs> it's really fun to be able to love all them, spoil them, spoil them, and then send them home. Go home. Um, I'll go ahead and say some sources will say there were only seven, but these sources are false, and they did not do their research. Boom. Because two of the children were named Philip. Yep. There's a reason. Yep. Um, the children in order of birth, starting with the oldest, were Philip, Angelica, Alexander Jr., John Church, William Stephen, Eliza, and Philip, who went by Little Phil. There were 20 years between the oldest and the youngest. Mm. Mm-hmm. We will discuss the death of Philip later, um, but little Phil was born the year after Philip's death, Mm -hmm. and he was named after his big brother that he would never meet. Yes. So sad. Um, Hamilton had a close relationship with Eliza's family um, and frequently wrote back and forth to Eliza's sisters, um, Angelica and Margarita. Who went by Peggy? How do you get Peggy out of Margaret? <laughs> Apparently, Peggy is a nickname from Margaret. I don't know why. But, but it's Margarita. Yeah, but Margaret. I Peggy, mean, I do know Peggy is one for Margaret. My my granny's name was Margaret. Yeah, um, so I mean, I'm, I would think that it just kind of followed that. It's like when people that are named Richard go by Dick. And I'm like, <laughs> it has no, it's not even close. Well, but you know, my, my hedgehog's name was Sir Henry Pricklesworth, and we called him Hank. Well, yeah, I mean, it's like, there's just so many names. There's like the nickname, the nickname is this. And it's like, no, it's not. That doesn't even sound the same. Well, I'm just saying that's why, that's where it came from. It was common, like, with Charlotte, you understand calling them Letty. I mean, yeah, that you you can see that. But anyway, I'm just just, telling you what I know. It's, it's, anyways, it's crazy. Um, I thought I had something in here about when she got married, but I'm not sure. Apparently, I didn't think it was that important. Um. (laughs) So let's just say Leo was right. So, sure. Um, but the letters between Hamilton and Angelica were very flirtatious. Mm. But there's never been any indication that they were more than friends. Nothing ever happened between the two of them. The I mean, letters, Was there a comma in the middle of a phrase? Look, I don't know. I, I actually do think that that is true. But I think I read that in the Hamilton Revolution. But... Uh, but yeah, they they were very flirtatious with one another and were very affectionate. But there is no indication they ever crossed that line. Yeah, with one another. So there was mutual admiration. Yes, for sure. Yes, there was. Um, so Hamil- she was very bright in her own right too. Very, so I mean, they so. they very much enjoyed right. sparring and she'll with each pop other. Up, she'll pop up a little bit more, just kind of briefly um, at different times. That I didn't think she was still here, but she was. (laughs) So Hamilton was finally given command of three battalions in July of 1781 after Washington. (laughs) Hamilton turned around and he gave Washington an ultimatum. Yeah. And said. That didn't work out so well. Oh, it did. (laughs) Hamilton said, quote, and thus tactfully threatening to resign. If I do not get my desired command. Boom. Under Hamilton's command at the Battle of Yorktown, his soldiers attacked at night and took over. It's kind of a type of fortress. It's too much. It was too much to actually go into and try and, and, it, and describe. But it was basically a fortress that the British built. Mm-hmm. Um, a colonel for the British was heard saying, quote, push on my brave boys and skin the bastards. Unquote. This attack forced the British to surrender an entire army. Wow. And it marked the unofficial end of the Revolutionary Mm -hmm. War. Um, A few battles were fought here and there until the Treaty of Paris was signed two years later. But Yorktown marked the de facto end of the war, which de facto just means it was recognized by everyone to be the end. But by law, it was not the end. Right. It wasn't officially. Mm -hmm. But that was the one that that ended it all for him. 
Once back in New York City, Hamilton took the bar uh, exam in July of 1782. After teaching himself the law for six months, just six months, at the same time, he was appointed to the Congress of the Confederation, but only served for a year. When he was nominated by his father-in-law, Philip Schuyler, um, he was serving as an assemblyman for the New York State Legislature. Thankfully, some of his ideas were shot down. <laughs> because at the He was a radical thinker. Well, not as radical as you would think. So at the Constitutional Convention, he proposed the president and senators be elected for life. I mean, for the senators, right now, I'm done. <laughs> far off. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, they could be removed for corruption or abuse, and it would just be contingent on, quote, good behavior. Um, he wanted to take self-government out of the Constitution, uh, which, you know, okay, um, and said that the power should go to the rich and well-born, mm-hmm. which is funny. Because he was neither. Well, John Adams referred to Hamilton as, quote, the bastard brat of a Scottish peddler. There you go. I think that's the last one. So (laughs) Maybe. um, There were some kind of thoughts behind these, you know. There might have been, you know, some thought behind. Well, maybe because they would be the ones that would have more of an education back then. I mean, I, I... I'm not saying I agree with him. I'm yeah. just saying I'm, I'm trying to understand why he would say that. Mm-hmm. And that, I mean, that would make sense because to be educated, mm-hmm. you know, you kind of know more about how things should work. Right. So there was some kind of thought behind these monarchy-like ideas, which Hamilton defended, saying, quote, And let me observe that an executive is less dangerous to the liberties of the people when in office during life than for seven years. It may be said this constitutes as an elective monarchy, but by making the executive subject to impeachment, the term monarchy cannot apply. So, I see the justification behind it because what he's saying is that it's less dangerous to have someone in power for life than for seven years because that president could push to get everything done during his presidency, right? which could be more dangerous to the country as a whole. I get that. Still sounds like a monarchy. Yeah. You're Uh, right. Yeah. At the end of the convention, Hamilton wasn't completely happy with the outcome, but he signed anyway. And then he also urged the other delegates to sign as well because it was much better than the Articles of Confederation, which were currently in place. So even though he didn't like it and they didn't take his ideas, he still supported it. Yeah. I mean, and I think from what I have seen and read and such you know he was very much for debate and he knew that that was going to be best Mm -hmm. I mean we had to have something in place to move forward so and it was discussed and the majority ruled you know and given that his original position on the constitution was that he was not for it you know he you know he had his own ideas and he wasn't a part of it didn't like it still signed it anyways Mm. given all that it's a little shocking that he wrote a majority of the federalist papers Mm -hmm. which defended the constitution 51 to be precise (sighs) quote Alexander joins forces with James Madison and John Jay to write a series of essays defending the new United States Constitution entitled The Federalist Papers. The plan was to write a total of 25 essays, the work divided evenly among the three men. In the end, they wrote 85 essays in a span of six months. John Jay got sick after writing five. James Madison wrote 29. And And Hamilton Hamilton wrote wrote the the other other 51. 51. If you don't know, that is a direct quote 
from Hamilton the Musical, but it's the best way. I, I couldn't. It's so concisely done. Right. I couldn't pare it down any any more <laughs> to try and like somehow. Like, and we love Lynn and we want to use his him. words. And I mean, man, if there's nothing that gets you hyped up, listen to that song and listen to him saying Hamilton wrote the other 51 and like you will get chills because yeah. it's just it's so impactful. But I may text uh, Kayla just about every time I hear it just because it's like her favorite part of the show. Well, and Leah got me the sticker that's <laughs> under my desk um, at my office. And it says, if Alexander Hamilton could write 51 essays in six months, then you can handle this. That's right. <laughs> that's right. So... Washington appointed Hamilton as the first Secretary of the Treasury in 1789, and Hamilton had a laundry list of accomplishments in this position. Some of these are the first report on public credit, establishing a national bank and the U.S. Mint, the start of the U.S. Coast Guard, the formation of the first political party, the Federalists. He established the New York Evening Post. He helped reopen King's College under the name Columbia College. And the unfortunate whiskey tax that led to the Whiskey Rebellion. Well, he can't be perfect. Yeah. So, December 17th of 1794, Hamilton gave his resignation to Washington and returned to his law office so he could be closer to his family. Mm-hmm. That was when Miss Mariah Reynolds walked into his life. Rut row. America's first. Wearing a red dress. Oh, yes. <laughs> to which Ellie goes, why is Peggy wearing a red dress? <laughs> anyway. So. America's first sex scandal happened in 1797 when Hamilton was confronted about his sexual relationship with Mariah Reynolds. James Reynolds. Her husband was well aware of the affair and extorted a thousand dollars out of Hamilton to keep quiet. Over the course of a year, including the initial bribe, Hamilton paid James Reynolds one thousand three hundred dollars to continue sleeping with Mariah. Yikes! I want to take a wild guess at how much thirteen hundred dollars is today? <sighs> Five thousand. That's always your guess. I'm, I'm not good with numbers. Was 30, I right? No. 30, <laughs> no. 36933 dollars. Mercy. Yeah. This would all come out in 1797 when Hamilton was accused of colluding with James Reynolds during the Revolutionary War. Three congressmen had known of the affair for a few years, and the men agreed to keep it a secret. But one of those men, James Monroe, was friends with Thomas Jefferson. Mm. And Monroe gave the documents supporting the affair to Jefferson. Mm. Then Jefferson sat on the documents for a good five years. Biding his time. Until it was beneficial to leak them to the press. And that is exactly what happened. Yep. Copies of the letters between Reynolds and Hamilton were published in pamphlets, and news was spreading that Hamilton was untrustworthy. This is when Hamilton released a retort called Observations on Certain Documents, or more commonly known as the, the Reynolds, Reynolds pamphlet. pamphlet. A 100-page one, <laughs> <laughs> booklet. <laughs> booklet. Booklet, not a pamphlet, a booklet. And it described the affair in very specific detail. Hamilton's reputation did take a large hit, and the affair did support the claim from Jefferson in regards to how trustworthy Hamilton was. Thankfully for Hamilton, Washington was on his side. Ha-ha. And held him in, quote, high self-esteem for the rest of his life. So even though it happened, George Washington was like, nah, we're cool. Yeah. yeah. Nah, he's cool. We, we all mess up. It's fine, bro. Well, I mean, I was going to say, it, it doesn't, even, even that, I mean, we all 
all make mistakes, mm-hmm. absolutely, because, you know, hey, we're human. Just because somebody makes a mistake and makes a bad decision, mm-hmm. bad judgment, or a series of bad decisions, doesn't negate the good that they have done mm-hmm. as well. And mm-hmm. I think so many people have have trouble yeah, separating, separating that and too. seeing mm-hmm. that. You know, you can not like some things that somebody does, but still like other things that they do. Mm-hmm. So Exactly. Uh, Washington and Hamilton were called back to military service for the quasi war and (laughs) Washington flat out refused to actually go to battle unless (laughs) there was a French invasion. So Hamilton served as essentially the head of the army. Well, I mean, Washington had kind of put in his time. Yeah. Uh, And soon after that, you know, Washington died on December 14th of 1799, and Hamilton became the senior officer of the United States Army. This was three months before Hamilton would join Aaron Burr as co-counsel in the Manhattan Well murder trial on March 31st of 1800, episode one, if you're wondering. With an interesting piece of clothes. Mm-hmm. Um, little did Hamilton know... The election of 1800 would be the breaking point between himself and Aaron Burr. John Adams and Hamilton had a very sordid past themselves uh, with Adams running for re-election. Uh, Hamilton was determined for anyone else but Adams to represent the Federalist Party. Hamilton sent out a pamphlet to 200 of his fellow Federalists entitled Letter from Alexander Hamilton Concerning the Public Conduct and Character of John Adams Esquire, President of the United States. A copy of this ended up in the hands of a Democratic Republican, and it was published in the paper. Uh, Uh, It did hurt Adams' prospects considerably and ensured that the Federalists would not win the election Mm -hmm. at all. Uh, Jeff uh, Thomas Jefferson beat Adams, but Jefferson and Burr had the same number of votes at 73. Given that Hamilton was so influential in ruining Adams' chances, some Federalists in the House of Representatives looked to him for guidance. Uh, 35 ballots had already been cast in the Jefferson-Burr runoff when Hamilton said Jefferson was, quote, by far not so a dangerous man, and that Burr was, quote, a mischievous enemy to the principal measure of the past administration. Hard word. Sometimes. (laughs) Jefferson won. Um, At the time, the runner-up became vice president, but after Hamilton's comment about Burr, Jefferson started to have his own concerns with Burr, and that was when he started to change that, that the, you know, he couldn't be vice president. And Jefferson actually, like, shut him out of a lot, and we'll go more into it in the next um, episode. So this leads us to the last, and arguably most significant event in Hamilton's life before his death. We will talk about um, kind of, you know, more about what led to the duel uh, in the next one, but Mm. this is kind of the most last, the most significant event um, at this time. The oldest child of the Hamiltons was Philip Hamilton, which Google him. Philip Google him. He is hot. <laughs> he, it, he is very attractive. Um, so anyways, he was born January 2nd of 1782. Philip graduated from Columbia College, which was what was formerly King's College, um, in 1800 and studied law under his father's supervision. It was said that Philip studied from the time he dressed in the morning until 9 at night and even had to wake up at 6 a.m. to study. Ugh. Um, I don't wake up for 6 a.m. for anything ever, really. Then on July 4th of 1801, George Eaker gave an Independence Day speech. Philip became enraged when Eaker said that Alexander Hamilton would not be opposed to overthrowing Thomas Jefferson's presidency by force. 
On November 20th of 1801, Philip and a friend ran into Eaker at the Park Theater and verbal sparring ensued. Mm -hmm. Philip challenged Eaker to a duel and Alexander Hamilton told his son specifically to delope, which means you don't, you kind of like shoot at the ground or you shoot in the sky. That's what deloping is. Yeah. You're, you're not going to. You're not actually going to yeah. aim at the other person. Mm -mm. So November 23rd, Eaker and Philip took off to Weehawken, the same spot Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr would be in three years. And the two counted off 10 paces. Eaker shot Philip above his right hip and the bullet went through his body and lodged in his left arm. A fire from Philip's pistol. Uh, a shot was fired when from Philip's pistol, but uh, it was when he hit the ground, so it could have been an involuntary spasm from from being shot. Yeah, um, <clears throat> you know, not really sure. Philip was rushed to his aunt Angelica's house in Manhattan. Alexander ran to Doctor Hosek's home, and he'll come back a lot more too. Um, so Alexander ran to Doctor Hosek's home to get Doctor Hosek and take him to Philip which is the same doctor that would later treat Alexander. Uh -huh. And it is said that when Alexander reached the Hosek home, he was, quote, so much overcome by his anxiety that he fainted and remained some time in my family before he was sufficiently recovered to proceed. Ooh. Um, Alexander finally reached Philip, and according to Dr. Hosek, quote, he initially turned from the bed and taking me by the hand, which he grasped with all the agony of grief, he exclaimed in a tone and manner that I, that can never be effaced from my memory. And he said, doctor, I despair. Mm. Philip died at 5 a.m. on November 24th of 1801, 14 hours after the duel. Alexander Hamilton had to be held up by friends and family at the funeral of his son. Philip is buried at Trinity Church in an unmarked grave near his parents and his aunt. Why unmarked? Because it was a duel? <clears throat> it doesn't say. Mm -hmm. They never say why it's unmarked. Um, I don't think it was because of a duel, because Alexander has, has yeah, a marker. I mean, I just wonder. Um, I, I'm not sure. It could be that at the time they were only burying like prominent members of society in there. So... I'm not sure, but to this day, it's, it's supposedly still unmarked. I don't remember seeing it, so but I wasn't looking um, either. Right. So, um, Philip's 17-year-old sister, Angelica Hamilton, suffered a mental breakdown from which she never recovered. Mm. Her mental state deteriorated until she became only intermittently lucid, and she sometimes couldn't even remember her, who her family members were. She spent the rest of her life in a state which was only described as a, quote, eternal childhood, often talking to her brother as if he were still alive. That's very sad. On June 2nd of 1802, Elizabeth gave birth to their youngest child, with whom she was pregnant at the time of Philip's death. Um, they named the baby Philip Hamilton in memory of his older brother. So That's why there are two Philips. We're going to stop there, because this is right up before the duel. And then I'll cover the aftermath of the duel for Hamilton's family um, after the duel occurs. Uh, so that wraps up part one for us. I uh, know it was kind of long and believe it or not, actually, we're not doing too bad on time, but believe it or not, I cut out a lot of stuff <laughs> that, that I really wanted to include, but um, I just, I love the story so much for a lot of reasons. And it's not just because of the musical It's yeah. there, there's, we'll get into it. Like I said, there's a little bonus section at the end of the next episode and we'll, we'll get into more of it, but it really is just a good story, and mm -hmm. um, so many things were going on at that time. It's it's just, you know. And getting a, a better picture of the lives of these people that mm -hmm. you've heard about in your history books, like getting to know more about them mm -hmm. and kind of what made them how they were and right. who they were. It, it's interesting to me. That's what I love right. to learn about is, you know, what formed mm -hmm. them. So... Sorry if these two episodes are a little long. This actually wasn't too bad. So, so good thing there. 
Um, next week we will have part two and we will go through the life of Aaron Burr and finally the duel in Weehawken and the death of Alexander Hamilton. Yeah, it's, um, more we'll go into that in that episode, they'll, we'll kind of talk a lot more about kind of the gasoline that was poured on the fire, um, that caused everything after the election of 1800 Mm -hmm. to really explode. We'll go into that some more. We'll talk about Aaron Burr. Like I said, we got a little bonus section at the end that I had to put in. Um, You'll also find out some pretty interesting things about Aaron Burr that you probably did not know. Yep. And one part that especially delights me. So we'll have to discuss that. Okay, I'm ready. I know. So we're going to be doing that next week. So come back and please join us for part two. And that does it for us this week. Yep. Different time, same time. <laughs> <laughs> so follow us on Instagram at One Nation Under Crime and on Twitter at ONUC Pod. If you love our podcast as much as we do, please follow us on your preferred podcast platform as we are now on all of them and recommend us to your friends, family, coworkers, strangers on the street, fast food drive through attendant. Just if you need to make conversation, just pull it out of your pocket. Yeah, yeah. Conversation's dead here. Hey, yeah. let me let me see your phone and just, let me let me do something for you. Just keep that in your back pocket to bring out at any time. <laughs> and if you feel like it, please leave us a five star review on Apple Podcasts. And if you do leave a comment in there for some weird reason, it actually counts more. Um, so if you want to do that, we'd appreciate it. We do have a Patreon. If you would like to help with the cost of making and hosting the show, you can donate there. Just go to patreon.com and search for One Nation Under Crime. Um, if you have a question for us, comment, glowing, review. Um, We'd prefer that. Yeah. Or a really, really good family story. Mm-hmm. A really good one. Um, you can email us at one nation under crime at gmail.com. We would love to read them and we will answer. I promise. Yep. <laughs> so thank you guys for listening to this week's episode of One Nation Under Crime. We will see you here same time. Same Same crime crime. next week. And remember that there isn't always liberty and justice for all. We'll see you next week. Bye, guys.